You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Srivasa Prakash. Hey guys, I wanted to take this opportunity to remind you all to like and subscribe. It really helps me to keep getting the best guests onto the podcast. So I really appreciate it if you did. And now on to the video. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today I've got an amazing legendary guest. I've got the legendary Jim O'Shaughnessy uh, from O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. He's also the host of the amazing Infinite Loops podcast, which helps you become a better thinker, a better investor, and overall a better and smarter human being. So thank you so much for being on the podcast and I'm really excited to talk to you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So Jim, for anyone who might not be aware, could you sort of give a little bit about your background, how you got into investing and your journey to Wall Street and founding OSAM today? Sure. Um, So I got interested in investing when I was about your age. You're 17 and that was about the same age that I was. Uh, when my uncles uh, were all over for dinner one night, uh, and it being an Irish family, there were maybe 10 people at the table plus 12 opinions. Uh, but they started, <laughs> they started to get into an argument about uh, IBM. Uh, and now this was uh, back in 1977. And so I was listening to my uncles and I'm like, you know, it was all about the CEO this or, you know, it was all about narrative. It wasn't about numbers. And so I piped in and was, don't you guys think it's more about, you know, what kind of, how much you have to pay for IBM for what you're getting and things like that. And they just looked at me like, shut up, kid. <laughs> so, so I went down, uh, I, I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I, uh, there was a great research library there called the James J. Hill, who was a railroad baron, and he'd given this library. Um, and I went with a big paper uh, spreadsheet. Uh, because 1977. Right. Uh, and, and, and originally I was going to try to do the S&P 500. I was going to list the companies and then list all of the ratios and factors and things. But being a naturally lazy per th- uh, person, actually bordering on sloth, I decided to uh, do the Dow 30 instead. Um, so I did that uh, for several years, had to look it all up by hand, et cetera. And what I found was what my thesis was, the numbers matter. And, and so in the limited uh, experience that I had there, I, I, I found that they did, but I was you know, pretty much a normal 17 year old. So girls and other things took precedence. <laughs> then when, when, when I got back to it in kind of my mid twenties, uh, there were computers and I had databases. Uh, and so I just became absolutely obsessed with trying to figure out the stock market. And may you know what 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 would define a, a good way to buy? What would define a good way to sell? What what should you not buy? And and I felt that the best way to do that was to do a an historical look at what has worked. Right. Because you know essentially, as long as human beings are pricing securities, markets change all the time, but human behavior hasn't changed for millennia, right? So if you're looking for an edge, you know, arbitraging human nature is your final and lasting edge. But so I was a numbers guy um, and uh, did my first book called Invest Like the Best, which showed you how to clone your favorite money manager by looking, doing a factor profile of them and then using those factors to come up with a portfolio that performs very much like them. But that book led to the book that I'm best known for, which is what called works on Wall Street. Yeah. yeah, what works on Wall Street. That's awesome. Uh, thank you. Um, and that was the book that kind of put me on the map. Uh, back uh, when it came out, there had been a lot of um, academic studies that looked at things like factors and whatnot. You know, the French Fama, Lacanashock at all. Uh, you know, some some really good research, by the way. Right. But you know, I, I was a practitioner. Uh, in other words, I was in the business. And, and so I decided that a book format that could reach a lot more people would probably be better. And uh, I, 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 that was a good guess. <laughs> because uh, the, after the book came out, 
literally all of our business was incoming. Uh, we didn't have to make any outgoing phone calls. Wow. All, all of them were, are you the guy who wrote the book, What Works? Yes, will you manage my money? Um, <laughs> and uh, so I was very lucky, uh, but it also was very consistent with my belief that nowadays we're calling it, you know, working in public and creating in public. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I believed that the more you told, the better off you were going to be and the better off the people you were working with were going to be. Uh, which was kind of at odds with um, Wall Street's mentality then, and even kind of now. Um, I, I, I took the path of, I'm going to tell you everything. Right. And, and you know, if, if, if you don't want to hire me, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You can read the book. Um, but I did know the other part of this, which is a much bigger part of learning to be a successful investor, is that you know, we're all born with the same human operating system, right? Me, you, all your friends, all my friends. And it has a lot of uh, bugs in it. And, and one of, or many of them uh, revolve around uh, the fight or flight uh, instinct of, that all animals have, and humans included, and how that takes over our brain when markets get really crazy. Um, and so... Th that was my actually deeper research. I mean, obviously the, the research for what works was pretty intense, uh, but um, to, to put it into a framework that made people understand better why it would continue to work over time, not all the time. Uh, you know, we've gone through a, dr a drought on some of our value stuff. Our momentum stuff is doing okay, but um, you're always going to, face that. And, but when you, when you get into it and you start talking about why this works, you, you know, there's a great cartoon um, of a, a you, you wouldn't know it, you're young, but it was called Pogo. And one of his most famous uh, panels of his cartoon was Pogo, his little uh, animal sitting there and saying, we've met the enemy and it's us. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's kind of the, the medium uh, length version of how I got into this. Right. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I remember reading about you was that one day before uh, the October 1987 crash, you actually, you know, you used to have, the, you had this put position on the market and then, you know, you sort of, and you got out just one day before it crashed. So uh, I was just curious. So, you know, if, you know, you're in, re in retrospect, you know, what went wrong and what would you have done uh, differently? So in retrospect, I would, I would frame it differently. I would say that that was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me because it, it made me fully aware of just how powerful emotions were, even to a guy like me who was back then also a, just a numbers investor. Um, and it really solidified for me the need to, to become a full quant mm -hmm. uh, versus just a, 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 a quant driven investor. And, and the reason for that was I concluded that, you know, here, here, here was I who had done a lot of research on how our emotions screw up our investing. And yet I let my emotions screw up mine because you're kidding yourself if you think that you're going to be able to have the willpower to uh, withstand it. Because what happens in a simplified format is, you know, so, so our brains evolved, right? right. And, and so our back brain, what I call the reptile brain, which other people call the pr primitive brain, et cetera. So that is where like a lot of these emotional controls and the hypocalamus and, and, and whatnot, but the prefrontal cortex, which gives us iPhones and gives us Zoom, which we like very much, basically gets shut down. When you, when you feel, and here's, this is a bug in our operating system. We are still opti uh, optimized for a world that didn't, hasn't existed for 100,000 years, right? So we are still optimized for hunting and gathering on the plains of the savannah. And, and so we're optimized for now, now, right? And so mm -hmm. recency bias 
in other words, overweighting, heavily overweighting whatever is happening right now uh, and discounting very uh, much whatever might happen or what happened in the past is one of the toughest of these biases uh, to, to get away from. But what happens is when the emotions take over, your, 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 your prefrontal cortex, your executive brain shuts off and your emotions take over. And, and you, can do, you, you can understand this if you keep a journal, which I do um, and would recommend you at age 17. If you start it now, man, you'd be <laughs> like, I had a 99% of your pairs. Um, and so what, ha what actually happened in the trade um, was I was using a, a, a different methodology, but it was a, a quantitative methodology that measured pretty simply, is the market very expensive or is it very cheap? Right. And so that indicator, by the way, I no longer use that indicator because uh, it, 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 as I watched it, it, it really didn't work very well. It worked about 50 one percent of the time that's not enough of an edge <laughs> anyway, back then i didn't have enough data to know that but so it, it reached its highest level of expensive mm -hmm. in i think august or september of 1987 so i'm like okay i was op i was an options trader back then not a long-term investor like i am now um and so i just started amassing this put position and you know, I'm sure everyone listening knows that puts go up if the market goes down, right? right? Because they give you the right to sell a security at a certain price to someone else. So as I was amassing this, I was getting more and more nervous, right? Because you know, I'm 27 years old and I've got a, a young child and a wife and a house and everything else. And, and so it was like the market started getting really volatile um, in September, which made me more nervous, not less, right? Um, and then back then there was no internet, there were no chat rooms. Well, there were chat rooms, there actually were chat rooms. Uh, but um, so I started hearing from a lot of brokers and everything else on, on the day before the crash, because that day was horrible. I mean, right. that day was like, one of the biggest down days that we'd ex certainly in my lifetime experience. Um, and I just got absolutely convinced that I had to get out because the, I, 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 I got out with a very, very small profit. Um, and I mean, small. Um, and, and then, and I felt just massively relieved. Because, you know, I was thinking, oh, man, I missed a bullet because everybody that I'm listening to is in like all the market experts were saying, this is it. This is the buying opportunity today. Buy it close. Buy it close. Well, we all know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so and uh, I, I, being a human being, could not resist going back and looking at how much money I would have made uh, had I kept the puts. A small fortune. Uh, but really even with retrospect, I look at that as like cheap tuition really, because it, it cemented for me at a young age, um, all of the things that I now live by. And, and it really gave me firsthand, i.e. me, <laughs> uh, information that I wasn't any different than anyone else and that we're all the same. And anyone right. who thinks that they're different I'm sure that I'm, I'm sure there are a few people who are, but I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to play those odds. So it was actually really a good thing. And, and it also just gives me the opportunity to say, again, I, are most of your listeners young or, or does it go across the map or? It, it does go across the map. Yeah. Okay. So for you young investors, but even for your not so young investors, one of, one of the things that is really, really great to understand and know is that if you're feeling massively emotional about something, it's almost always the wrong instinct, right? And it's not always, not always, right? Because after all, we are the descendants of the people who ran away when they saw that rustling bush on the right. savanna. 
uh, we, we are uh, here because they did run away and they did take quick action. But that isn't the way the world works anymore, but our brain doesn't know that. And so um, if, if you can understand that now and really internalize it, you'll probably do better than, I don't know, 90% of the investors out there over time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the factors or one of the facts of, you know, using a quantitative uh, system or a quantitative model is that, you know, you're able to avoid a lot of these biases. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, when or how did you get into this quant field? And, you know, you mentioned that you were sort of, you sort of became a fully systematized quant as opposed to, you know, someone who is just a quant investor. So what's, what is the difference between the two? So, so the difference between the two in my mind, and again, I, this is open to interpretation, but I, I, I am bounded by rules that I do not override, mm -hmm. okay? So I know through uh, tests of our strategies over as much market data as we have available, and some of that goes back nearly 100 years now, I know what the bat uh, batting average or base rate of a strategy that I'm using is. I know what its worst drawdown looked like uh, directionally, right? Because that doesn't mean it, you can't experience a worse dra drawdown in the future, but directionally, it's really good information to have because mm -hmm. very few people go into buying a stock and saying, I, you know, I might lose 30% of my money here, right? <laughs> where, whereas a quant does. Right. It's we know every time we buy or sell a group of stocks, we understand kind of three things. We understand that, number one, a percentage of those stocks will fail mm -hmm. and they, they could fail badly. Uh, two, we understand that um, as, as is typical of the 80-20 rule, you know, 80 percent of our returns are going to come from 20 percent of the names. The problem is that we also understand number three we don't know when we're buying them, which 20% of the names that's gonna be. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that, that a pure quant does is, and actually this is something I'm most proud of. I have been a professional investor for more than 30 years and I've never overridden a model. And wow. that's hard. <laughs> I mean, that, it is, is. That, that is the really hard stuff. We had a, we had a, um, a consultant come out uh, to OSAM after the great financial crisis, when you must, you must have been what, eight or seven, so you didn't know much about it. Uh, it was but, four. <laughs> four. Okay, there you go. Okay, even better. Um, but he came out and he specialized in quants. So he would visit all the various quant shops. And he told me something that really just kind of surprised me and not in a good way. He told me that over 60% of the quants that he covered overrode their models during the crisis. Wow. And from the way I look at it is, that means all of their previous track record was invalidated. Because the, the track record is predicated on the idea that you're not going to override the model, right? And, and that's really, you know, people used to say to me, well, what happens if you get hit by a bus? And I'm like, <laughs> nothing. Uh, the models are all programmed into our computers. Uh, if I get hit by a bus tonight, the algorithms are going to run and pick the stocks tomorrow exactly like they did today when I was alive and approved them. And I said, the only thing you might want to worry about is whoever succeeds me will he or she have the same emotion emotional fortitude to stick with it when things get very, very rough. And you know, I think that Patrick O'Shaughnessy, my son, who's the CEO of OSAM now, has demonstrated time and again that he has that fortitude. Mm -hmm. So that I mean, it's it's funny, but it's those kind of simple things. To translate it for for um, useful advice for your listeners, everybody's different, right? And and so what I advocate is study a lot, uh, read a lot of books, uh, not just about finance. Read about evolutionary psychology and biology and history. Um, and finance, and then find a strategy that's right for you. And I have found after talking to hundreds, maybe thousands of investors over my career, that the, the people who really managed to do very well 
were the people who had found a method that was right for them. That can be all over the map. It can be somebody who indexes their entire portfolio and never thinks about it again. I'm fine with that. As a matter of fact, I often say, if, if you're not going to study, do that, right? right. Because it, wh why, why think you can jump into a game that's a very complicated and <laughs> kind of like the Olympics of business and think you're going to do okay? Right. Um, but if you're not, then study and find a path that's right for you. And you don't have to be a quant either, by the way. Right. Yeah, I think it's really helpful because it enforces rules that are very difficult to mentally overcome. But I have a friend in um, Vienna who, um, he, he is not a quant, but one thing, and we've talked a lot, one thing that he does that I think is like really smart is when he's looking at his screens and he feels himself getting like really wound up, he literally shuts his computer off he goes, changes his clothes, and takes a run. He finds by the time that he comes back that all of that, that pent-up anxiety and everything has dissipated quite a bit mm -hmm. and, and revisit what he was thinking about. So that's an interrupt, right? Correct. If, if you can come up with a way that, you, that works for you mm -hmm. that interrupts an emotional moment, that 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 will be very helpful right and you know when you say that you know people should pick a strategy that works for them do you think that most people get the emotional or the risk management do you think people get that side of the things wrong or do you think people tend to believe in things that don't you know that aren't actually you no know, working those are those are strategies that don't actually work because when i was listening to your um incredible interview with uh, lily frankus uh, you know you mentioned that People should be focusing on models, which is what you have. And you don't have beliefs, you have models. And do you think that most people sort of get the strategy part wrong? Or do you think they get the emotional part wrong? I think they get, um, I think they get the emotional part wrong most. And w one of the reasons why I reframed um, beliefs to models is because I've looked into this extensively. And again, I have the same human OS you have. Mm -hmm. We all do. So, so thinking that you're an exception is first, it's an error. And, and then that error compounds negatively if Correct. you continue to think that. So the reason why I think reframing it as I have a model that posits this thesis is it's, it's stilted language, but that's okay. Because what it's trying to do is sever the tie that happens for the majority of us. The majority of us have an opinion on something, right? On everything, right? <laughs> and, and the problem is we conflate our opinion with fact. And the more we do that, the more we tie that opinion to our identity, right? And so when, when we allow our beliefs, which by the way, are probably wrong. If you understand anything about history uh, and you go back 250 years, most of what the smartest people believed 250 years ago is wrong, right? It's just wrong. And so if you don't have a method that allows for ongoing error correction, you're gonna you're gonna be wrong, wronger every time that you cling to that belief, right? Right. Yeah. So one of the one of the ways that you can short circuit that from happening is to think of your beliefs as hypotheses that can be tested. The other thing that's interesting when you look into beliefs versus models, so, so words themselves, words themselves are so laden with semantic power, symbolism, et cetera. We have very little idea about how strong labels can be. We have very little idea how strong a certain association that we have with a word that others might not have, right? Mm -hmm. And and we also 
don't really want to think about it because it screws up our thinking, right? It's like, <laughs> ah, ah. And, and, and so, but, but when you, when you marry your at first opinions that become beliefs that become in your mind facts, you stop thinking about it. And the other side of your brain, which I call the prover, that's not original with me. It's original with a guy uh, named Orr 50 years ago, O-R-R. Um, and your prover literally blocks out information which contradicts what you believe. And, and so when you get into things like social media, what are you going to do? You're going to follow people who agree with you. Right. You are going to love echo chambers and, and hate being challenged. You are going to issue a lot of things like you see on Twitter all the time. You know, this is a hill I will die on. And, and I always say when I see that, I, I follow the General George S. Patton rule, which is I'm going to make the other poor dumb bastard die on his hill. I don't want to die on my hill. And so it's not that I don't have strong feelings. I do. I just think it's a mistake, especially in an exogenous environment, which I have no control over, right? Other than my own actions. Correct. To, to, to cling to a belief when evidence presents itself that negates it. Mm -hmm. I mean, th th what we're talking about here is the scientific method, right? People, I, it always drives me a little crazy when people say the science is settled. Anyone who says that honestly does not understand one thing <laughs> about science and is probably a salesperson because the very ethos of the scientific method is take no one's word for it. Mm -hmm. That's the motto in Latin of the British uh, society of that Isaac Newton was a, a member of. And, and, and another writer, um, Ryan North, put it even uh, more colorfully. He says, the, the ethos of the scientific method is pure punk rock anarchy. In other words, don't trust anyone. Don't believe the man. Don't right. say because the authorities said, I'm going to believe it. You say quite the opposite. You're like, no, I don't believe that. Show me. I, I needed to see the evidence. And, and the final thing that I would say about beliefs is sometimes we inherit them from our peer group, from our parents, from our family, from an experience, whatever, but they haven't been tested. And, and so beliefs almost are formed based on faith many times, which, which is required because there's an absence of evidence. Right. And so models are the other way around. They normally get formed or hypotheses for the most part, speculations, get, get formed because there's a lot of evidence that suggests that that might be right. But as you, as you internally make this switch over to the way you think, it becomes just so much easier to continually error correct. Right. And, and to continually say, oh, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. I owe, and, and the other thing I would say is reframe what people call a failure, right? That's the, the association most people have with failure stops them dead in their tracks because they're, they're worried about what other people are going to think of them. They're worried about, you know, their significant other might laugh or, or disdain them or whatever. And so they freeze. Failure is just an opportunity to learn something. Right. And, and I've never met in my life, and I'm, I've had the great good fortune to meet a lot of incredibly interesting people. I have never met a very successful person who had not failed at something. And so it's almost kind of like, if you really want to succeed, you, you should kind of understand that Failing is part of the deal because that's, that is what allows error correction. Right. And, you know, I found what you just said about the scientific method to be, you know, really, <laughs> really interesting because, you know, especially when it comes to say politics or even investing, you know, a lot of people, uh, they just, they just tend to hold onto a belief without actually looking at the facts. And uh, because number one, uh, they're either like really, uh, they really have that belief ingrained into them or, uh, they have sort of 
Uh, they start. Uh, they sort of just cling on to a belief, regardless of the facts, because you know they've they've already done a lot of work into sort of proving that belief and just confirming it. So I just wanted to ask you, you know, at OSAM, you know, what are the different steps in testing an idea or a factor or a hypothesis? Uh, well, wow, that so th that that's going to be kind of a long answer. Um, so we start with fundamentals, right? So. We start with the with the idea that markets work um, for a variety of reasons, but mostly because markets are complex adaptive systems that generally a complex ab adaptive system is one where there are many players down here causing complexity. Mm -hmm. Adaptive means that if something changes, the players or the agents will change their behavior, right? Systems, that's what becomes the market, right? That are normally efficient. And by efficient, I mean markets normally clear. Clearing means if I wanna buy Google at 80 bucks and you wanna sell it at 80 bucks or 81, a mechanism will take place so that the price changes just to a point where you're happy to take the, uh, let's, so, set, call, yeah, let's call it 80 and a half, right? 80.5. And I'm happy to say, okay, I, I'll buy it for that. So, so markets clear and markets are uh, amazing, amazing uh, adaptations. They, they come from... Um, cumulative societal evolution. If you look back in history, it, you know, markets have, have come a long way. So we start with that kind of as our hypothesis. And then we say, all right, wh what are some just like basic axioms mm -hmm. that, that we should test? So w one idea of that would be um, given a choice, a person is probably going to want to pay 50 cents for a dollar's worth of assets more than they would want to pay $10 for a dollar's worth of assets. Okay. So we test that axiom and through a variety of value factors. And there's, it's a robust finding that is true. Now, there are other people who don't care too much about what the current assets are worth, mm -hmm. but have, a, have an idea that that particular company or industry is going to explode. Right. And, and that, yeah, they've only got $10 worth of assets now, but um, what if they're going to have like a hundred or a thousand dollars worth of assets in a couple of years? What we found on that side of the equation is that the typical factors that you would think might be indicative of a good buy. So for example, things like buying stocks with the highest profit margins or buying stocks with the uh, largest increase in sales mm -hmm. um, or any of that would work. They don't work. In fact, they work so badly that you get like T-bill results. And that's because what happens is people get overly excited about new things and new inventions. And so people always have, right? right. So when, when, when radio came around, RCA, which was the American company that was the biggest radio company, went to a price, I think in the 20s, that it never regained because people priced all of the future <laughs> into RCA. Um, and, and so... What we found on that side, because we're indifferent between attitudes, we we have venture we do venture capital. We have a thing called positive sum that my son is the uh, managing partner of, but that's a VC style fund, and that's by definition investing in the future. Um, so we're indifferent as to value versus the growth mindset. But um, what we found, we, we we try to be very practical, and so we found what does work on those kind of growth names is price momentum. Buying stocks based on price momentum 
also takes advantage of that complex adaptive system that's working in your favor, right? So if you try to explain from beginning to end why an iPhone works, good luck with that. <laughs> um, but we know that it does. And it does because the, the, that many people with specialized knowledge contribute. Right. Um, and that's the same in markets um, with an exception which I'll tell you about in a minute. But in general, momentum, which we've tested all the way back to 1927, wow. works amazingly well. And it works, I think, because of the nature of markets being, um, you know, the wisdom of crowds. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a, there's a hiccup, as there always is, in that, Markets are complex adaptive systems with feedback loops, okay? That's how people change, right? If there was no feedback loop, people wouldn't change. Right. Most of the time, that's cool because people have uh, heterogeneous or different opinions. Mm -hmm. You're 17, I'm 60. Uh, we could have very different opinions. We could have some similar opinions, but you know, you might like growth much better. I might like value much better. That's normal. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter. It's not really a demographic thing. It's the size of that investor base. There's inevitably, it's like the Irish uh, table of 10 where there's 12 opinions, right? <laughs> so so um, heterogeneous opinions are great because they cancel each other out. And the net result you can see in price movement, mm -hmm. right? So uh, Damon Runyon had a great quote, which is um, the battle may not always be to the strong nor the race to the swift, but that's the way to bet. Right. Um, so, so in general, that's right. Now, there do exist periods and we seem to be living through quite a few of them in a short amount of time here <laughs> where, where uh, what, what happens to these um, heterogeneous agents is because of the feedback loop, what happens is an information cascade, okay? And an information cascade, think of like the uh, most powerful waterfall you've ever seen or rapid that you've ever seen. It just pulls everything with it. Everything that happens to get in that water is going the right, it's going the way of the water. Yeah. And, and so these information cascades turn enough agents operating in the game space of the market to homogeneous beliefs. In other words, everybody believes the same thing. Okay. So that creates both bubbles and crashes, mm -hmm. right? So when everybody believes the, the same thing, momentum inverts, and, and during, especially during a bear market, you're, you're much better off buying the worst momentum stocks at the bottom of a bear market than the best. Um, but that's, that's what causes sort of these little mini bubbles. My friend Howard Lindzen had a very, very clever, he changes his handle name all the time on Twitter. Um, and uh, he's a, he's a uh, seed stage investor. Um, and he, he changed his handle to tiny bubbles, which I love <laughs> because it, it was very clever because what he was saying, I think, was that there were a bunch of, a bunch of bubbles in various markets, various places that were happening uh, concurrently and simultaneously. Um, but ultimately bubbles burst. They, always do. And what happens is the, that there is a, a great amount of destruction of economic value. If you're on the wrong side of that, it's painful. It could wipe you out. If you, if you could have a 150 year old company and like Lehman Brothers um, and go out of business. Um, but it's kind of like it's kind of like the the to everything there is a season, right? Because after a bubble bursts, it leaves a lot of really interesting assets. Kind of like think about it like um, 
let's use the same waterfall and that it and the the water <laughs> crushes a house that's at the bottom right because it got it got really rainy and and the whole house gets crushed mm -hmm. well if you happen to wander around after that you'd notice a lot of interesting assets lying around correct like maybe there's a nice silver tray or blah 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 well, that's, that's kind of what happens in markets after bubbles burst. So like the classic one was the, um, the dot-com bubble. Um, and um, after it happened, there were a ton of things that were good things that happened as a result of it. It caught, people paid way too much for it to happen, but they happened like, um, you know, like all the cable that got laid, like, you know, there's just a whole host of things that became assets for the future, right? So how do you, how do you square this in, in kind of the individual investor looking at things? Well, it's very difficult to know when a bubble will pop. It's sometimes even difficult to even know that there is a bubble. Right. Um, and it's also, and actually a lot harder to know when a market has bottomed, right? So again, we don't time the market at all. I very rarely make forecasts um, because I, I, I just assume I'm normally gonna be wrong. Um, but sometimes the, the data is so persuasive that it's like pounding me on the head saying, hey, dummy, write something, write something, write something. And, and so that happened in um, 2009. The data was so overwhelming that we had, we, had, we had done so much damage to the market that nine, the 10 years ending, I think February of 2009 were the worst 10 year period except one which was the 10 year period ending May of 1920. And then we, so what do we do? We have a theory, we have a test. Well, let's, okay, let's find the 50 worst 10 year periods for real returns. And then let's look at what happened one year, three year, five years, seven years, and 10 years later. Well, as we found, when you get to three years, there are no negative returns mm -hmm. in all 50 of those, those periods. And, and there were some other things that caused me to publish this thing. It's available at the Oshan, OSAM website if anyone wanted to read it, it called A Generational Buying Opportunity. But lest I, I, I go, uh, lull you into thinking that I'm a super forecaster, I'm not, because I also wrote another piece saying uh, a generational selling opportunity for long bonds like four years ago. And I was totally wrong. <laughs> So, so you, you've got to have that humility to know that's the other thing. If you think you're smarter than the stock market, you are wrong and the market will show you how wrong you are. Correct. Um, so, but, but then, you know, there's a lot of technical things we do with say like back tests to make sure we're not fooling ourselves without knowing we're fooling ourselves. Right. Um, that's called honest minded data mining. And so we split the data up randomly and do it to see directionally if the results are the same. We uh, do a process called bootstrapping, which uh, really mixes it up. And again, what you're looking for is do all of the individual vectors point the same direction? Right. If they do, then you've got a pretty good test that hasn't been data mined. If they don't, you got to start looking for a data mining that happened, and in our case, it would be innocently, but you have to, as a, as a consumer of financial uh, information, you need to look really closely at a lot of people's methodologies because that was the other thing I did with What Works on Wall Street. I published the methodology. Right. And, and, and I said in it, I'm doing this because this should replicate. If somebody in Toronto got the same database that I was using and used the same codes that I would have sent them happily, uh, they should get the same results, right? Mm -hmm. For a study to have veracity, it has to be 
uh, reproducible. And, and so th that's another thing that we do. And then the final thing we do, which actually led us to a wonderful 20 plus year relationship with the Royal Bank of Canada, is we test our strategies in other markets outside the US. And the first one we tested was Canada. Um, and they joked that, you know, when are you going to write what works on Bay Street? And uh, <laughs> so uh, we have a relationship with them, as I say, which has been great. Uh, but then we test like all international markets. We test emerging markets. We test every market. And do all markets always comply? No. Right. I mean, there are a few notable exceptions, Japan being one. They get into a bubble so big during the 1980s that it is still unwinding itself. Correct. Yeah. Um, Russia, you really wouldn't want to be a buyer of Russian stocks in 1917. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's like, okay, fine. But if, if, it works in 95% of all auction-based markets, you're on to something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. So basically, you know, to sort of sum up what you just said, it's just focus on, you know, testing every idea and make sure, you know, you're not fooling yourself. You're making sure that, you know, those ideas are number one, uh, or the studies are reproducible and, you know, you're able to stick with the results. And so, you know, when you talk about these models, you know, there should, or at least I, I want to believe that there are some common threads in these models. So do you have any common principles for these models? And could you uh, reveal them? So, uh, sure, there, there are common principles. Um, one is that ultimately, if you pay too much for an asset, no matter how fantastic its growth, you're probably not going to do well mm -hmm. uh, because you will have priced it to perfection and um, it perfection rarely never happens. Nothing's perfect. Um, that's a common, that's a very common thing. Uh, another commonality is that things that we think might intuitively make sense sometimes or often do like buying stocks that are cheap often leads to doing well um, but other in intuitions like uh, best sales gains best profit margins best return on equity etc you're, you're forgetting the second order effects of a company that has the best profit margins right Companies with the best profit margins get people excited. They bid it up so that it becomes very expensive. Their high profit margins attracts competitors to their space, driving down those profit margins and you know, rinse and repeat. Uh, markets are, are wonderfully destructive in terms of um, they are, it's, did you, you ever see the movie, The Matrix? No, but I've been told to watch it. So Okay, so, so, so you should, you'd probably like it. But so, so in the matrix, there are these machines that, that are hunter machines, right? And so they just go out and hunt and they're searching for like electrical impulse signals and then they kill them. Um, and that's the market, <laughs> except it's searching for profits. And, and it's like a machine that, again, the beauty of markets are that, well, here's a really good example. Markets that are controlled uh, by um, exogenous uh, uh, people or, or organizations. So um, in the United States, uh, the healthcare market is, is controlled by and large by the uh, legislators in Washington, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, what you can see in, in what I call captured, regulatory capture of a marketplace is that the costs go up, mm -hmm. okay? But if you look at a free market in the same ecosystem, right? So in medicine, in medical or healthcare, and you look and you say, are there any examples where it's not under regulatory capture? Yeah, there are a lot. And one, for example, would be LASIK surgery for your eyes. Right. So what happened with LASIK surgery? 
the price has come down it, right? Because markets were allowed to operate. Mm-hmm. Not only has the price plummeted, but the, the outcome of the LASIK surgery has improved dramatically. Right. So generally, not always, and you know, two words that I always try to ban from my mouth are never and always. <laughs> Those things never happen. I mean, here we go, see? Uh, so the, the overwhelming amount of evidence is if, if you can allow a market to be free, it will normally lead to increasing quality at reducing cost because of all the people competing Correct. in that market. Mm-hmm. If you get a market that is in regulatory capture, education would be another one in the United States. I know that Canada is different on both healthcare and education. Um, but if you have regulatory capture, what you see in those markets is the product quality declines and the price goes up. And so those are useful kind of general principles when you're thinking about something um, investment related to right. kind of think about. Got it. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, you've done that I, that, you know, most, uh, or at least of, uh, at least a few of our listeners haven't done is, you know, we've not lived through, say, for example, a dot-com bubble or the housing bubble. So, you know, personally, do you see, you know, any signs of, I would say, uh, you know, any signs of, say, 1990s or any reminiscences of the 1990s, for example, or <laughs> I was just curious to hear your thoughts. So everywhere. Um, non-fungible tokens, uh, <laughs> inventing items to buy, which I think is kind of cool, but it, it is I- I- uh, indicative of a frothy mm-hmm. investing environment. Now, the problem there is that we concurrent with that have the U.S. Federal Reserve uh, acting in a manner that it hasn't ever acted in historically. In other words, they are printing tons of money. Now, where does that money go? Well, so far, it's gone into inflating asset prices, right? right? It hasn't shown up as much, although in certain key consumer sectors, it has shown up as inflation. Um, but the, the challenge in, in this kind of market is you're never going to be able to time it, right? And so what I like to say is it's interesting, but I don't really have much useful to say about it because I can't tell you when this is going to end. Right. And the problem is that this has been this has been a kind of a frothy market for the last six years, mm-hmm. right? And and if you had some kind of draconian system that said, I will exit all markets if they get to a, 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 a CAPE ratio of whatever, that's the 10-year PE ratio Bob Schiller at Yale is famous yeah. for. Horrible indicator. <laughs> I, I love Bob. I love his work. His work is amazing. Uh, but that indicator would have kept you out of making a ton of money. Mm-hmm. And so what I often tell people is, especially if you're not gifted at timing, and I think most people are not gifted at timing, and that is a result and a residual our, of our emotional decision-making, get you know, the smartest thing that I the smartest advice I could give you as a 17 year old guy is if you've got a job, put money into the market on a monthly basis, uh, buy a world ETF, um, and, and, and follow your passions that are elsewhere. Because, I mean, you know, the stock market, one of the things that attracted it, me to it, it's the Olympics of business. Mm-hmm. Right. Because it's and, and what I love about it is there's always something new. 
And, and so I am voraciously curious about everything. And so it's kind of like the perfect environment for me because like I read five hours a day pretty Correct. much. And like Warren and, Buffett. <laughs> and well, right. I mean, you know, he's not wrong. He's yeah. not wrong. I have never met. And that's another thing. I said earlier that I'd never met a super successful person uh, who had not failed. Here's another one that I've never met. I have never met anyone who was super good at anything that did not read constantly, mm -hmm. that was not curious. Uh, Dorothy Parker was a, was a wag in the 30s and uh, uh, a uh, frequent member of what they called the Algonquin Roundtable. The Algonquin is a hotel in Manhattan. Um, and, and she said, the cure for boredom is curiosity. And then she said, there is no cure for curiosity. <laughs> so she's right. She's right. And if you are very, very curious, you can't help yourself. You are compelled to, to learn and read and, and listen right. uh, to podcasts and, and things like that. And that's great because if you get, if you have a method that allows error correction, you are going to be able to build an amazing base of knowledge. And I, again, I'm, I'm a very pragmatic person. You know, scholars hate me because it's like, and, and by, by, by that, I mean, it's like, so if they spend like their entire career studying Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching, mm -hmm. great, but I love Tao, I, I love Taoism and the Tao Te Ching, but I'm looking more for use, less for meaning. And so found a lot of use there, did a lot of threads on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I am, I always try to take away a practical application and, but that's because I also believe that, you know, I could be the smartest guy in the world. And if I didn't do anything, it doesn't matter. Right. You gotta, you gotta marry it with taking action. Got it. Got it. Jim, any closing thoughts? <laughs> so sure. Um, listen, uh, I, I am wildly bullish on humanity. Uh, I, I will probably never be short human ingenuity, mm -hmm. right? Um, everything, when you look around, walk around Toronto, uh, I'll walk around Manhattan and think of you and everything you see came out of the mind of a human being. And that even includes, like, if you're looking at a beautifully landscaped yard, it wasn't naturally that way. Mm -hmm. And and so I am a huge believer in progress, and that progress is based on our ability to come up with solutions to even really intractable problems. Right. And and by the way, this is not to say there aren't problems. There are plenty of problems. And, and I believe that we will continue to learn enough to uh, surmount them. So right. it, if, I, if I could give your listeners one piece of advice is your life is going to go a lot better if you are a pragmatic optimist than if you are a pessimist. Got it. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Jim. It was awesome having you. And Cheers, you know, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank you so okay. much.